Hi there, my name is Aaron Adams, and today I'm going to be talking about technology. Um, for those of you who have been on the channel, I've done several one takes, singing some songs, and we're going to do a little bit of a turn here and jump into technology. So what we're going to be dealing with in particular is audio consoles in your space. Now, a lot of people will argue that the audio console is the most important piece of equipment in your space. This is really only half true. Um, as far as your people and operating your sound in your space, it is true. But as far as your space actually sounding good in the first place, that's really not accurate. The best thing that you can do is really to get quality loudspeakers designed well and implemented in your space correctly. Um, but that is really far outside the scope of what most people in their church can do. Even people with full-time audio technicians, most of the time you're better off hiring in that designer, hiring in that install, and getting that done right. Um, so we will not be addressing that here today. What we will be addressing is the audio console, which as far as actual operation day-to-day, Sunday-to-Sunday, is the most important piece of your kit. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is where my church is, what we currently operate, and how where we're going to go. So I'm today I'm going to deal with the consoles that we currently have, our current experience with those consoles and our situation, and then move on to the consoles that we're going to be picking between moving forward. Now my church has already picked. I'm going to do my best not to give away what we've picked. But uh, this is this is where we are, okay? So at my church, we have two, actually three different kinds of systems. We have a console in the sanctuary. We have a console in our student space, which we call the loft. And we have a console in our dining hall. And they're all different, right? So in our sanctuary, we have the Digico SD9, which you can see here on my screen. Um, let's see if we can find a nicer picture of this. There's a nice picture. Look at that. Boom. So this is the SD9. And this is a really nice console. It sounds great. It performs great. It does everything you need it to do and then some. Um, but what this console does lack is some features that we might like to have. Um, this console does not have a built-in personal monitoring system. For that, we had to buy an extra Aviom card and use our, we are using the older Aviom for personal monitoring. Um, it does not have a personal monitoring app as some of the other consoles do. Um, so we can't add on to that kind of a system without having just our front of house operator run monitors. So. Um, it's fully customizable. You see 24 faders here, and you've got four banks on each side, each in banks of 12, and it'll do anything that you want. Um, you can lay it out with channel inputs or auxiliary outputs, or they call them control groups, but they're DCAs, if that's the term you're more familiar with. Um, and the interface is actually really, really nice once you get used to it, but it's not the easiest interface to get used to. So what we're going to look here is you'll see these knobs here underneath the screen. And what these do is these control the actual parameters that you have selected on the screen. So you select the kinds of parameters you want, <clears throat> your gain and trim from this button, your low pass filter and high pass filter, your compressor, you get a one knob compressor this way, one knob gate this way, your auxiliary sends, you hit your aux button and you pan up and down, up and down to find which row of auxes you get and then these will behave that way. And then you have pan actual pan down here. Um, and so uh, rather than selecting a channel and then having all of its functions in front of you like that, um, which you do get some of those over here, we'll, we'll do that in a second. Um, the big thing that this console does is it has everything laid out in front of you for every channel. You select the function that you want and then you can adjust the parameter for which channel that you're dealing with by selecting which side of the console the screen is looking at. 
You also notice that there is a channel here highlighted in gold. And what this is doing is selecting the channel. And there are a couple different ways that you can set it up to do it. You can set it up to where you have to press on the screen to select the channel. Or you can set it up to where you have a uh, touch sensitive. When you touch a fader, it selects a channel. There's no default select button here. So, and when you do that, this channel processing section activates, which gives you your four band EQ with your Q gain and frequency selections in all of them. Uh, an option to make the high and low settings a shelf, uh, a button to turn your EQ on and off, high pass filter and low pass filter, um, your compressor, your compressor gain, your one knob compressor, compressor gain, and your gate. <clears throat> so this is nice, this is handy. You can switch the order whether you want it to go EQ to compressor or compressor to EQ. And then a couple of other buttons that allow you to do other things. Um, so that's that's really the bulk of how this thing works is you've got everything out in front of you and there's a couple, you know, you got high pass filter over here, but you can also select high pass filter here and then work with the knobs if you need to do high pass filters on a bunch of channels at once. It's really nice. I really like running it, but when I'm teaching a new person how to run sound, this is very overwhelming. Um, just the sheer amount of functions that it can do. And if you want to use solo or you want to join into control groups, you either have to go find that control group, which is pretty typical. Um, and, then your, and then your screen will do the rest. Or you have to hit this LCD function button. And these buttons can do a lot of things. These silver buttons you see here, they default to solo. But they can join and leave your control groups. They can... Uh, assign and unassign what your faders are doing. There's a lot of different functions that they have, um, which once again, I like a lot as the hired guy who's there. But when I'm teaching people how to run sound, that can be kind of daunting. In our student space, we're using the X32. Here's that. This is a common console that you'll see in a lot of places. So in our student center, we're using the X32. And the X32 has become very popular in church world because of it's affordable, it handles 32 inputs. It really does uh, 32 microphone inputs, but it does 40 inputs total once you count its auxiliary inputs and uh, other things like that, that will not give you microphone gain control. And it has what kind of a little more of what we're used to, a three button setup, which is a, becoming more standard on consoles. Solo, or solo is at the top, Mute is at the bottom and select. Solo is at the top. Mute is at the bottom of the scribble strip. Select is way at the top of the channel meter. And when you select your channel, that populates a single channel strip, which is here, which this picture moves around. So that's a little disorienting. I'm sorry about that. Um, and so what this has in it is it's got your gain, your high pass filter your one knob compressor, your one knob gate, your three controllers for your EQ, which is gain, Q, and frequency, along with four buttons to select which band of EQ you're using. Over here, you'll also have your pan and the ability to assign to a mono bus and do a sense to a mono bus. They also include a bus sends section, which maps one through four, 5 through 8, 9 through 12, 13 through 16, and Matt assigns these rotary encoders to do that for whichever selected channel you have. Um, they do have a sends on fader function located here. There's a button. That means if you're selecting a, an auxiliary send or something, it will populate the channel input faders to show you what that mix is. If you are using your channel inputs and you hit this, it will populate your output faders to show you what you're sending everywhere. So that's the basics for the X32, and that's the bulk of the functionality that a volunteer would use, right? And so in our environment, we are using volunteers. And so what we have going on, oh, well, this give me a, oh, it's gonna change the pictures on me, that's fun. What we have going on is that we are volunteer driven. So in our sanctuary, in the console that's difficult to teach people, I'm not the only mixer. In our sanctuary, it's volunteer driven. We have volunteers run in front of house on the SD9, but it's hard to teach it to them. 
Um, in our student center, we also have volunteers run front of house. On the X32, it's proven easy to teach it to them. They've picked up much faster. Now, you might argue that that's because they're kids and kids pick up things faster in there, and that may be true, but it still does seem to be an easier system to teach people in our environment. Every environment is going to be different, so you have to pick what works for you. Our dining hall is still running an analog desk. So, given that, regardless of which one is actually easier to teach, it really doesn't matter which one you teach to people, because if I move them from one venue to another, we lose their ability to know how to navigate that console. The channel strip on the X32 is not the same as the channel strip on the SD9. And if you're not a seasoned audio pro, if you're not somebody who's, you know, really, really diving into how to be a good audio engineer all the time. Not that our people don't try their very best to be the best audio engineer that they can be, but this is just not what they're doing full time. Some of them are students going to school and some of them are real estate agents selling real estate. That's what they do. This is what they, this is their area of service and they commit to it and they do the best they can. They also do a very good job, but learning how to navigate that new system then is, oh, this isn't laid out the same, I'm not used to this, I need to figure out how to deal with this, and it takes them a little longer to get that figured out than somebody who's constantly mixing and constantly thinking through their channel layouts and how they want things to be arranged and all those kinds of things that we might think about. So, we've concluded that we really need to get all of our spaces onto the same system and that it needs to be an easy system to teach people. So with that being said, I'm going to talk to you now about the two consoles that are our front runners for that. Before we dive into the consoles that we are going to be choosing from in our church, we really need to dive into what our needs are. So our first and foremost need is it has to be able to scale up to take handle every input in our sanctuary. Right now, our sanctuary runs 41 inputs on a Sunday, which means we have to have at least 48 inputs on the console. So that is quite limiting. In fact, they don't make a Behringer X48. Otherwise, that might have been a real option for us. They only make the X32. So while that might have been convenient to have people come over and already have a platform that they know, it's just not possible or feasible because it doesn't exist. So it has to have 48 inputs. Um, we want to be able to do uh, personal monitor mixing over an app is one of the goals of ours. So rather than have those Aviums that are out on the stage and have an Avion brain hooked up and do all the things that you need to do for that, we want to move to having people get out their phones, connect to a particular mix, and control their mix via their phone. So for that, there's lots and lots and lots of consoles that actually do that right now. But the Digico is not one of them. So that was a feature that we really wanted. I guess you wouldn't call that a need, but it's a high on our priority list. The last thing that we, this one is a true need, is it needs to be easy to teach people. Our X32 is easy to teach people how to use. Our SD9 is not. And so that is, that is a significant factor of this. The fourth thing that it's going to need is it needs to scale down to spaces like our student center and our dining hall without becoming exorbitantly expensive. So even if we decided to commit to the uh, Digico SD series, their small form factor SD, I think it's the 11, is still very expensive. I believe it was like $12,000 for us to get that set up appropriately in our loft if we were going to do that. For a youth ministry, that's prohibitively expensive. Um, so that's a challenge that we have to overcome, and that's going to prevent us from going the route of just putting SD consoles all over our campus. Although it would be nice, like I said, they're excellent consoles, but they do not have the feature set that we are hoping for, and they're prohibitively expensive. So with that being said, now we're going to get into the consoles that we are choosing between. So here is one of our choices. This is the Allen & Heath SQ series. The one we're going to look at is the SQ7, because the one that we always start looking at is the one in our sanctuary. It has to be able to handle all of our inputs, all of our outputs, and be usable for our people. So we're going to dive right in. 
the SQ series, all of the SQ series handle 48 inputs and this is kind of a misnomer, but they claim 36 output buses. This is not an entirely fair assertion. Um, what they do really have, let me see if I can find it in here. Do, 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 do. Uh, they have 12 stereo outputs and a left right output, which is your main. They have three stereo matrices and eight stereo effects engines with dedicated returns. So these do not take up other outputs. That does not equal 36. So there's not really 36 mixes, even though there are 36 outputs technically. So that's something that we need to keep in mind here. So what we do really have though, is in addition to our main output, 12 stereo outputs that we can do mixes for and three stereo matrices. For us, this is probably enough. We can use the matrices to do our other outputs like our broadcast mix, which is one. We have as another recording mix that we do separate for our broadcast mix because the recorder and the broadcaster need different kind amounts of sound sent to them. That takes up two of those. And uh, that leaves us a third one for ancillary sending of audio around the campus. The 12 stereo mixes give us enough outputs that we can still have our nine, we use nine avioms right now, and two additional in-ear monitor systems that are fed by the console. That does 11 of our mixes. So we would still have a mix output left over to add wedges and other things that we needed. Um, or, um, and this is totally possible and doable, the ME personal monitoring systems do exist here. So if we would like to stay on something that is Aviom-esque, or if we simply need extra mixes, we can always grab some of these, free up some of those mixes, and be off to the races. So this is going to meet our needs, which is great. Here's its uh, SQ4U app, which is handy. Um, and so now let's look at the actual uh, surface here. So here is the big picture of the SQ7. Now, this one is another one of those zoom of those move arounds. So this will be kind of kind of different. Okay, so here we have their channel strip section and we have their faders. So this console features 33 faders, which is 32 assignable faders and a master fader, which is very nice. These are assi hyper assignable. You can do anything with these. You can send an aux mix to one of these. You can assign an input channel to one of these. You can assign uh, outputs to them. You can assign anything that's on your console, your effects mixes, your effects returns, everything that you've got can be assigned to these faders, which is really nice. It's hyper com uh, configurable, similar to the Digico console. So that's great. They have the standard mute, select, and paffle or solo button. Um, and they have six layers of these to do. They're all custom. It's wonderful. They also have some view options with their scribble strips. So you can change your view here, which is handy. Their actual channel strip section is right here. And it's actually pretty standard. I want to call it standard. It's probably not entirely fair. It's a nice, I think, easy to learn channel strip. It includes your gain, high pass filter, gate and compressor one knobs, your pan, your Q frequency and gain for your EQ, and your four EQ buttons to select your EQ band, along with a touch and turn knob that you can use in conjunction with the screen, and then buttons to be able to look at your IO, your setup, your scenes, your effects, to find your things that you need to make adjustments to, and then use the screen to touch and then use the knob to turn. This is a great way, I think, to be able to do things. Your basic channel strip is all right here in front of you with eight knobs, and they're the eight knobs that you really need and the four buttons to pick your EQ band. And honestly, it's very similar to the X32, right? You had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, if you don't count your bus sends and your mono output send, 
as additional knobs in your channel strip. Eight is your pan. It's literally the same uh, rotary encoder configuration as the X32. They're just arranged differently. And so that means that all of you who already know the X32 just have to learn where their knobs are that they're used to, where they're located on this console. I like that a lot. That means it's going to be really easy to move people from one of those to this. And it means that the ease of learning the X32 should transition over to this desk, which is nice. Now, this is a difference between, different from not only the X32, but also the SD9 that none of our people will be used to. You have select buttons over here on the right to select your mixes. This will let you select any of your 12 stereo outputs or your four effect sends or your master left right and it will populate these faders to represent them. Now, personally, I enjoy this a great deal, and I also think that this is going to be the ideal way for us to handle um, different things in our spaces. Um, for our audio engineers, for our front of house mixers, whatever you want to call them, when they have to work in a monitor right now, they have to go find either find that channel, pick the button, push the button that they need, and then adjust the rotary encoder appropriately, or once again, find your channel, push the couple of buttons that you need, find your aux output, turn the rotary encoder appropriately, or use sends on fader, go find the output that they're using, then hit sends on fader, and then they're all here. Likewise in here, you can go find your output in your output section, hit sends on fader, and populate along the left. Uh, our people are generally leaning towards the sends on fader functionality, which is also my preference because what that means is you're not just seeing, looking at the single channel's output to whatever mix bus. You select your mix bus and then you're looking at all the outputs that are going to it. And it lets you find and track down things that should be in there that aren't in there and things that shouldn't be in there that are much easier this way. Um, there's a little bit of a different mindset remembering that when I hit this button, I'm changing the whole mix. I'm looking at a different mix, right? Not necessarily changing the whole mix like I just said. I'm sorry about that. But I'm looking at a different mix. Um, when I hit this button, I'm looking at the floor wedge mix. When I hit this button, I'm looking at Kelly's in-ears. When I hit this button, I'm looking at Jackson's in-ears. Those kinds of things. And that can be ha handy because that means if somebody's using in-ear monitor systems and needs one of our helps to get their mix right, we can hit that button. We can solo that output and we can listen into what they're hearing and help them make adjustments which is super helpful because musicians are not not audio people this isn't what they do they play an instrument they sing they have things that they do well and this is one less thing for them to worry about so that is that is a difference that our people will have to learn but otherwise the bolt basic channel strip um will remain the same. This does also have 16 user assignable buttons along with eight rotary encoders with buttons paired to them that you can also assign to do, uh, you can have these be output sends if you really want them and you're too used to the X32. You can have these be um, sends to your effects units. Um, you can take one of your soft keys and have a tap tempo, handy things. These, both these, con this console also features a, uh, a library of presets for you to use with your different uh, channels. So you can set EQ for Sally when Sally's singing and uh, have an EQ for David when David comes in to sing instead. And just switch them even though they're going to be on the same input, same mic from week to week. So that's handy. Um, also here is a uh, copy and paste function. So you can copy and paste settings from one channel to the next if you get a really nice setting that you like and you want it to move over and have be applied to more than one person. So, um, nice features. The copy and paste are really nice. This library is really nice. These are particularly handy for those of us who are used to using them. For the people who are a little more old school and just like to mix, just like to mix, just like to be in it, um, those things, they may not even use them. But the still stands that the channel strip here is a very easy and simple thing to use and access, which is wonderful. So, 48 inputs, really 15 outputs, and then effect sends in your master send. Nice setup, nice console, fit, would fit our needs, and uh, it's a great desk. So our other option here is the Persona Series 3. 
the one we're going to be looking at here is the 64 Studio Live 64S. This is their newest flagship. It is 64 inputs and 32 mono outputs. So these can be paired to be stereo, which will give you 16 stereo outputs, or left separate as mono, so give you 32 mono outputs. You can pair them. Um, I think they always go odd to even, but you can do pairs of them and mono, and so you can have anywhere between 16 and 32 outputs, which is really nice, in addition to a master send, left-right send, and your auxiliary and your uh, effects outputs. So we're going to go down here. We're going to grab a picture so that we can see it real good. All right, so here we go. So the, uh, the Personas guys call their... Uh, channel strip they call it the fat channel so it's located right here okay and once again we have one two three four five six seven eight knobs it's the same eight knobs we had on the sq7 gain pan gate single knob comp single knob high pass filter gain frequency and q for your eq and here are your four buttons to pick which eq band you're using these other buttons will turn on and off your gates and compressors, center your pan, and do other ancillary functions as you see fit. Um, you also, just like the SQ7, has these buttons down here at the bottom to pick what you're looking at on your screen. So too does the Studio Live 64S. You can look at your input section, your gate, your compressor, your EQ, your auxiliary sends, whatever it is you need to look at. <clears throat> so. For the most part, the channel strips here are going to operate the same, which is nice. It means I'm not going to be hurt by either choosing either system. Also, the PreSonus console does have this wonderful knob over here, which is, again, a touch-and-turn knob to do your finer settings, to make adjustments to an effect, to uh, impact more of your feature functions on your compressor, whatever it is that you need it to do. Very handy. Um, here we go down to our fader bank. We have 33 faders here, 32 channel faders and a master fader. Now, um, here's where the differences start to happen. These are not nearly as configurable as the SQ series consoles are. So by default, <clears throat> you're gonna have your inputs, one through 32, then you're gonna page next, to see 33 through 64. Then you need to page next again to see your aux inputs, your tape in, stuff like that, um, and your outputs. Then you're gonna page again to see all of your DCAs. This does have, both of these consoles I believe do feature DCAs, although I do not remember how many of the SQ series features. I'm gonna deal with that later. So to see your DCAs and all the other things that you wanna see. Now, it's not locked into that, so it's a little, it can be a little awkward navigating this because over here on this eight faders on the right side here, if you don't have it assigned to do a separate function, it's just going to be a continuation of your paging through your inputs. But you can assign it to do something different. You can assign it to show you your aux outputs and page through next and previous through them. You can have it be. Um, your DCA groups, page next and through them. Um, and so those are different things that you can set through this to be. And when you do that, this starts to be 1 through 24, and then 25 through 48. And, and it will make this console feel a little weird to navigate through your groups because you have paging through rather than layers. Uh, not my favorite. Well, the channel strip is very easy to use, and I don't see our people needing to really see those aux outputs a ton the dca groups being over here could be handy and that that's not not ideal however the 32 mix buses are ideal and just like the sq7 selecting the mix bus on the left side here it's on the left instead of the right populates your faders to show you what's in that mix bus which is fantastic it's actually really really nice um and then you see your main mix here now, you'll notice there are only 16 buttons here and then four buttons that are purple at the bottom, so really there's 20 buttons total. Each one of them has two numbers on it. You have to hit it twice to see they're each assigned to two mixes. 
So hit it the first time for number one. It's hard to see that down there, but that says number one. Hit it the second time, you get mix 17. So that's how that works. Um, there is, however, a user layer. Here it is right here, this green button. So you can have a single layer of 32 faders that you can assign to be whatever it is that you wish. You can add in DCAs, control groups. You can turn these uh, these uh, outputs into control group into groups if you would prefer that. DCAs, you can have your groups. So you can have your drums group to have your basic mix for your drums. Your uh, different uh, DCAs for the mixes that don't alter too much. You know, I've got my guitars, got their mix down. I've got this, got the drums have their mix down. I've got the uh, keyboards have their mix down. Whatever you may decide that you need to do. Um, you break out your vocals that you need broken out, and the rest of them are part of a choir or something. You put those back into another DCA. And you can populate these 32 channel strips to do the basic things that you need. So it is 100% doable and usable here. This is going to really, what this is going to take to be successful is a little more setup up front from me. Um, so that way our user group and our channel layout on the first page are really, really, really easy to use. Um, and in fact, it may even be that we elect to have the user group not have DCAs on it and simply use the DCAs and have our eight biggest DCAs pop up over here. And these 24 be our primary things that we need in the user group. And then we just have a single button to push to adjust these. There, there are different ways to do this. You can really get, you're going to have to get a little creative with your workflow. Um, uh, but it'll really take some planning in advance is what this will take. Meanwhile, the SQ7 is going to give you really this op big opportunity to just lay it out however you want, six banks of whatever kinds of layouts that you would like. That's that's going to be, it's still going to take pre-planning and pre-doing, but it's probably not going to be as challenging, um, especially since you can, you know, use some labeling tape here and actually just tell, tell your people what's in them. This is going to be a little more learning. Um, but the actual basic functionality of it is going to be the same here um, with their channel strip and the way that things operate. Um, so this console does not have the same amount of user assignable functions. It only has eight user function buttons. But um, what this one and the full size 32S both have is scribble strips over their channel strip. And you can create a user layer on your channel strip as well. So you can have special assignments for your encoders and the buttons underneath them that will display on this channel strip here. And you can set up an additional set of functions here. So your user functions do still exist and you do still have enough of them uh, by my best assessment. Um, they have eight effects, sends, and dedicated returns. And they have the mutes for those effects stationed right here, which is really easy to access and handy. And selecting one of them will populate your screen to show you that effect, and you can touch and turn those effects as you need them, which is one of my preferred ways to make those adjustments. Um, so that is Studio Life 64S. So these are two things we're considering. Um, obviously, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. The advantages on the Allen Heath is it's highly customizable, so we can set it up very, very exactly to what we're going to need. Um, it's going to have a nicer sound quality for sure. They have 96 kilohertz sampling rates. They have, uh, it, it's a, it's a nicer quality of a desk is really what it amounts to. And so the Allen Heath SQ is definitely going to sound better. Um, but the Allen Heath starts to fall short when you get into I.O. So we're already using 41 inputs. So this Allen Heath console leaves me with only seven inputs to grow into. Meanwhile, the 64S gives me those seven inputs to grow into and 32 outputs. So I have plenty of outputs for all of my people to do all of the monitoring that I might need to do. So room to grow exists here in the 64S for sure, more than the SQ does, but it also isn't going to sound quite as nice. It's not as customizable, which means I'm going to have to do a little more planning, a little more work to be able to really get it to function. But 
in, in spite of that, these two consoles, really, once you start driving, once you start going, they're really going to go about the same. Pick your channel, your channel strip functions are here, your touch and turn controls, other things. Here you have pick your channel, your channel strip functions are here, your touch and turn controls, your other things. So that's really not, it's just really not going to be that big of a difference as far as the actual operations. So it's really more of a us as a church, you as a operator determining whether you're going to prioritize the sound quality of the SQ or the um, whether you're going to prioritize the sound quality of the SQ or the future room for growth in the 64S. Now, all that being said, price is always a factor. So we're going to get in here and we're going to go look for SQ7 costs. And we're going to find out uh, that there's an Audi SQ7. Did not know that. So, the Allen Heath SQ7 sits at about $5,000. It's 48 inputs, okay? And to scale down, they also have the SQ5, they have the 5, 6, and 7. So as we scale down, they get to about $3,000. So between three and $5,000 to output a place with these. Also worth noting, I'm going to hit this so I can show you the back panel here. The local I.O. on these, there are 24 inputs. Uh, there are 32 inputs and 16 outputs on both of these consoles natively. Okay, if I go over here to the 64S, 32 inputs, 16 outputs on both of these consoles natively built in. So if you want to go up to that 48 or if we want to go up to the 64, we're going to have to buy some stage boxes and expansions which is fine. We're looking at the base cost right now, though. To get these up and in and working and we'll expand into what we need, we can always do that as we go. So for the 64S, for the 64S, we're looking at $4,400. So about $600 less, not a huge difference at the top end of these two console series. Um, but when we get to their small form factor, which is called the 32SX. Nope, it's the SC. Whoopsies. We're now down to $2,200, and that is a much cheaper option than $3,000. So, um, also, I don't know the actual local I.O. on the 5 and on the 32SC. Let me see here. So a 32SC is going to have 16 inputs and 6 outputs built into it versus the Allen Heath SQ5 is going to have what? Nope, they're going to make me go all the way back. So the Allen Heath SQ5 is going to have 16 inputs and 12 outputs so they're they're pretty comparable as far as what's actually on the desk when you buy them so the pre sonuses are just coming in a little less expensive um and uh with a little bit of a difference um when you scale down underneath the 64s and the pre sonus you no longer have 48 inputs you only have 32 inputs um and 16 outputs versus the allen heath as you scale down in form factor, you can still get enough output or input and output expansions to have the 48 inputs and the 17 actual outputs that it has. So um, you never lose channel count by scaling down on the third on the uh, SQ series. You will lose some of the, you will lose half of them when you scale down on the Presonus Studio Live series, which honestly. Once you stop needing 48 inputs, you really, yeah, I mean, you drop from 48, your next step down is 32. So if you're not in a space that needs a minimum of 48 inputs, you're probably in a space that needs 32. Um, so I, for most situations, at least in our church, I can't see a, a time where that would actually become an issue. 
but it's something you need to remember. Um, so we're determining between these two fun uh, options right now, the SQ or the uh, 64S. Well, we've, we've already picked, but I'm not going to tell you which one we picked. <laughs> so um, that's what we're working for through right now. And so I do have a demo coming in for one of them, the one that we've chosen. And I will get into detail about why we chose the one that we chose and what we prioritized in my next video. Um, so, so there you have it. This is what we are working with for our church. Um, this is the con. This is the decisions that we've come to, the conclusions we've come to. And uh, I just want to say, I hope this video has blessed you. I hope it gives you a little bit of things to think about. Um, and I hope you're able to go do your own research and figure out what consoles are going to work best for you in your situation. So I hope, like I said, I hope this video is uh, a blessing to you and uh, just have a great day.